Hello everyone, we hope you enjoyed the listening mock test. In this video, we'll be checking the answers together. Before we start, please click the like button and subscribe to this channel for more sample tests and preparation materials. Your support means a lot and we hope to provide you with more quality content in the future. You will see the correct answers marked in red. We'll be playing the audio for you again so you can listen to what was said and better understand your mistakes. Leave your score in the comment section below and feel free to ask any questions you may have. Good luck, guys. Hey, Cindy. You look happy making plans for the summer vacation. I'm just glad the semester is finally over. I just finished my final exam, so I'm taking off for summer vacation tomorrow. Aren't you? I wish. What do you mean? I have to rewrite the lab report for my biology class. I guess I did it all wrong, so the professor's making me rewrite it before he'll submit a final grade. I guess that's better than if he just gave you a bad grade on it, right? I guess so. But I was planning on leaving town tomorrow, too, and now I'm not sure I can. I spoke with the professor, and he gave me two options. I can either turn in the revised report in one week and get my grade, or he said I can wait. You know, take an incomplete in the class and submit the paper next semester in the fall. So are you going to stay around to revise the report? I could. I'd get the grade for the class on time, and I wouldn't have to think about it anymore. But there's a family reunion this weekend. I was really looking forward to it. If I stay around to revise the report, I'll miss the reunion. Well, maybe you should take your time and work on the report over the summer. You can submit it when you return in the fall semester and get your grade then. That'd be fine. But what if I need materials from the library to revise the report? I don't know if I'd be able to find the materials at the library at home. Hmm. Hi, can I help you? I hope so. My name's Mark Whitman. I'm, um... Don't I remember you from last year? You worked in, uh, where was it? The, the art library? Yeah. Well, you're good. That was me. And I really enjoyed the work. Right. Yeah, your supervisor gave us some really great feedback at the end of the year. Oh, he's so organized. Always on time. Helpful. Really? Well, I'm glad. It was a good job. Well, we usually try to match students' jobs with their academic interests. Yeah, um, I'm not exactly sure what career I'm headed for, but librarian is a possibility. It was a great experience to learn how it works and, and meet some people working in the field. But for this year, well, that's what I wanted to ask about. Oh, how come you waited so long to come in? You know how fast campus jobs fill up. If you'd come in earlier, you could probably have gotten a library job again. I mean, since you have the experience from last year, you don't need the training at all. But it's been filled now. Yeah, I know. But I would plan to get a job working at a restaurant off campus this year. I really need to make more money than I did last year. And working as a waiter, well, there's always the tips. But uh, I've tried a ton of places, and I haven't found anything. I know it's really late, but, well, um... I was wondering if maybe there was some job that hadn't been taken, or maybe um, someone started a job and, you know, had to drop it or something? Well, I doubt you'll find well, anything. Could you, could you possibly check? I, I know it's a long shot, but my friend Suzanne, she takes photography classes in Harrison Hall, and um, she sort of thought there might be an opening in the janitorial staff. Um, why does your friend, the photography student, think she has information about a janitorial staff opening? I'm pretty sure those jobs are filled. In fact, I remember taking lots of applications for them. But let me double check it online. She said the whole studio arts building, and especially the photo lab, have been kind of, uh, sort of messy lately. I mean, she says there's, uh, chemicals and stuff left out, and, you know, it's like no one's been cleaning up. Oh, but that could just be, you know, students using the lab after hours or something, like after it's been cleaned. Hmm, hang on. There's a, there is um an asterisk next to one of the job numbers here. There's a note. Let's see. Huh, your friend's right. Seems like one of the student janitors quit a couple of weeks ago for some reason. <laughs> well, whatever. It looks like this is your lucky day. Wow, that is so great. So, who's the contact person? Check with the janitorial office. Fine. Thanks so much. Okay, so we've been discussing how companies use advertising to help sell their products. 
Now, although advertisements can benefit companies, there are people who are critical of advertising because of certain environmental problems it can cause. So let's talk about two ways advertising can be seen to negatively affect the environment. One way is by wasting natural resources, like trees, by advertising to consumers who do not have a need for the product or service, the advertisements irrelevant or useless for them. For instance, a piece of mail I got advertising a kitchen renovation service, a whole big booklet, lots of paper, about different ways to remodel your kitchen, changing the floors, adding new cupboards or appliances. But this was all a lot of wasted paper, wasted trees, because I don't even own my place. I rent an apartment. So a kitchen renovation service is irrelevant to me. I can't use it. And I'm sure that booklet was mailed to lots of other people who also rent and who just threw the booklet in the trash because they have no need for a kitchen renovation. Now, additionally, advertising can have a negative effect on the natural beauty of the environment. People are often less able to enjoy the beauty of the natural surroundings if there are large advertisements blocking their view of the landscape or distracting them from the natural beauty around them. Let's face it, no matter how beautiful an area of nature is to begin with, its beauty is damaged by visible advertisements. So, like, for example, this happens with big advertisements on the side of roads, huge billboards. Say there's a road passing through a beautiful area in the mountains, but there are all these big billboards advertising restaurants and products along the side of the road. The land is naturally very beautiful, but you can't fully appreciate it. The big billboard advertisements get in the way. Binoculars are handy, whether you're birding, boating, or just sitting in the cheap seats. They can also be bulky, heavy, and a pain to carry around. But imagine if contact lenses could be made to magnify images and serve as tiny, wearable binoculars. Swiss and U.S. researchers are working on just such an optical prosthetic, with funding from the U.S. Defense Department. The device is a very thin, reflective telescope inside a rigid contact lens just one and a half millimeters thick. When worn with a special pair of glasses, the effect is said to be like looking through a pair of low magnification binoculars. The lenses let you switch between normal vision and a view that's magnified nearly three times with the wink of an eye. The glasses help the contacts distinguish between intentional winks and involuntary blinks. The research team unveiled their latest prototype at the recent American Association for the Advancement of Science annual meeting. The technology could be worn on healthy eyes, which could mean checking certain baseball players, A-Rod, to make sure they're not wearing a pair. But it's really designed to help the visually impaired, especially those with age-related macular degeneration. If the system succeeds, it could offer a non-surgical option to help improve failing vision. Hi, Professor. I was hoping to ask you a few questions about the class you're teaching next semester, the course on Polish drama. I was thinking of taking it. Well, that's an upper division course. You don't look familiar to me. Are you a student in this department? No, actually I'm not. Okay. Have you had other classes in the Slavic languages department here or somewhere else? No, that's the thing. I was just wondering how good my Polish would have to be, whether the class is taught in Polish or not. Well, you'd have to have some knowledge of it. By that level, a lot of the students are quite fluent. Plus, there are some native speakers in the department. And we don't plan for it to happen, but it's pretty common for the discussions to kind of move in and out of English and Polish. And it can be difficult to follow. So, uh, how well do you speak Polish? Mm, not so great. It's just that my father's from there, so I'm interested in learning about, you know, Polish history, Polish culture. Plus, I'm studying drama. I'll probably major in it. I love plays, so I thought your course might be perfect. Hmm. To be honest with you, you have to realize that we'll be watching videos of performances, and maybe, if we can swing it, even watch a live performance. And those won't necessarily be in translation. Uh, also, texts. Texts are sometimes available in translation, but even then, some references will be to the original. I'd hope you'd be fairly confident in reading. Mm, to be honest, it sounds totally over my head. You know what? I believe they'll be offering a survey course on Polish literature. 
Let me check here. Yes, I, I thought it was being offered this time. Professor Jaworski's teaching it. Let's see, it covers the major works, you know, epic romantic poetry, the novels, and it does cover one or two plays. And this is in English? Yes, you'll be reading mostly English translations, and the discussions will be in English. Hmm, novels and poetry. They'll provide you with a great historical context for the plays, so when you do get to them, you're going to really have a feel for the times they lived in, so to speak. Plus, this course might also give you the impetus to learn more Polish, you know, get it to the level where you'd be ready for the other class. A thought experiment is a type of experiment that's carried out only in our imagination. These types of experiments help us to consider a hypothesis, theory, or principle for the sake of thinking about its results and consequences. The Swamp Man is one famous thought experiment designed by the American philosopher Donald Davidson. He first introduced it in his 1987 paper titled Knowing One's Own Mind. The experiment goes something like this. Suppose Davidson went out for a walk in the swamp one day and gets hit by lightning and dies as a result. Magically, at the exact same time, in another part of the swamp, the lightning rearranges some molecules into the exact same form of Davidson's body, molecule by molecule. This new being, which he calls the Swamp Man, is identical to Davidson down to the smallest respects. Now, the big question is, is the Swamp Man really a person? Can the Swamp Man think? Does this being have the same thoughts as Davidson? And does he have the same memories and recognize the same people? There are two broad reactions to this thought experiment the internalist's response, and the externalist's response. Let's start with the internalists. This group argues that the Swamp Man will be no different from Davidson. This outcome results from their belief that conscious experience and thoughts are causal conclusions of electrochemical processes that the brain produces, rather than just being their formal representations. In other words, they say that the brain is the seat of the mind and its physical structure forms and defines the mind. While they do acknowledge the virtual impossibility of an atom-by-atom -atom copy of Davidson, they argue that such a being would be a Davidson if not the Davidson. Externalists, on the other hand, think that conscious experience is in no way reducible to electrochemical reactions of the brain, and hence neural structure. So basically, what they're saying is that the mind is more than the physical constituents of the brain. Davidson's experiences and causal history are what make him who he is. If you take away all of this causal history, the individual will be left without any causal background of thought and thus any cognizance. Any utterance made by this being will have no meaning. Therefore, not only is the Swamp Man not Davidson, but it cannot even be seen as a human at all.